So we open up our study of history with an examination of Herodotus and his great work, The Histories. This is a very important work historically for its anthropological contributions. It was written in the time period and he was able to give so many insights that is useful to scholars. Um, and this is a text that would have been really known and studied by learned men from the past going all the way back to the classical times in ancient Greece and Rome. Any scholar during the medieval period or Renaissance or previous to that would have been familiar with the tales and events that Herodotus wrote about. So it really is a very important text and one that's worth considering. Uh, it was one of the first and possibly the first book of its kind where a real coherent compilation of stories and names and chronological events that all relate to a common theme are presented in in a historical way uh, now Herodotus has had his detractors his critics but i believe that godly in his introduction does a really great job dispelling the more unjust criticism and pointing out the merits of Herodotus's work. And I don't think I could do a much better job of an introduction than Godley did in the translation that he edited. So I'm just going to present his. Uh, and since this is the first real historical compilation from the classical world, we're going to start our own investigation into history here with Herodotus, the so-called father of history. It's impossible to give certain and undisputed dates for the lifetime of Herodotus, but if we are to believe Aulus Gellius, he was born in 484 BC, and the internal evidence of his history proves that he was alive during some part of the Peloponnesian War, as he alludes to incidents which occurred in its earlier years. He may therefore be safely said to have been a contemporary of the two great wars which respectively founded and ended the brief and brilliant preeminence of Athens and Hellas. He belongs in the fullest sense to the great period of Greek history. Now, when he says Hellas throughout here, keep in mind that is a name for Greece. Greece was not a country the way it is nowadays. It was a collection of city-states that were all loosely united in a common language and somewhat similar ancestry. And the whole mainland collectively was called Hellas. Herodotus was, it is agreed on all hands, a native of Halicarnassus in Caria, and if his birth fell in 484, he was born a subject of the great king, that would be Xerxes I. His early life was spent apparently in his native town, or possibly in the island of Samos, of which he shows an intimate knowledge. Tradition asserts that after a visit to Samos, he, quote, returned to Halicarnassus and expelled the tyrant, end quote. But when later he saw himself disliked by his countrymen, he went as a volunteer to Thurium when it was being colonized by the Athenians. There he died and lies buried in the marketplace. End quote. This is supported by good evidence, and there seems to be no reason for doubting it. It is also stated that he visited Athens and there recited some part of his history. This may have happened, as alleged, about the year 445. It is evident from his constant allusions to Athens that he knew it well and must have lived there. So much may be reasonably taken as certain. Beyond it we know very little. There is a large field for conjecture, and scholars have not hesitated to expatiate on it. If you're not familiar with that word, expatiate means to talk about something at great length. If Herodotus was banished from Halicarnassus for political reasons, it is probable that he was a man of some standing in his birthplace. The unquestioned fact that he traveled far makes it likely that he was well-to-do. But his history, full as it is to the brim of evidence of travel, is never, except in an occasional phrase, I have myself seen, and the like, autobiographical, and we know nothing from any actual statement of the historian's own of the date of his various visits to the countries which he describes. Probably they were spread over a considerable part of his life. All that can be said is that he must have visited Egypt after 460 BC, and may have been there before that date in Scythia and may have been before that date in Scythia. Nothing else can be asserted. We only know that at some time or other, Herodotus traveled not only in Greece and the Aegean, of which he obviously has personal knowledge, but also in a large part of what we call the Near East. He saw with his own eyes much of Asia Minor, Egypt, as far south as Aswan, 
Cyrene and the country around it, Syria and eastern land, perhaps as far as Mesopotamia, and the northern coast of the Black Sea. That would be the Euxinus Sea in Greek. Within these limits, Polon, Anthropon, Eden, Astea, Kai, Noon, Egno. That is quoting there from Homer's Odyssey. Uh, that means he saw the cities of many men and learned their minds. Speaking of Odysseus, but applying it here to Herodotus. But as the dates of his travels are unknown, so is their intention. Did he travel to collect materials for his history, its scheme already being formed? Or was that history the outcome of the traveler's experiences? We only know that Herodotus' wanderings and the nine books of his narrative are mutually interwoven. His professed object is, as he states it in the first sentence of his first book, to write the history of the Greco-Persian War. But in order to do this, he must first describe the rise of the Persian Empire, to which the chapters on Lydia and the story of Croesus are introductory. When he comes in due time to relate the Persian invasion of Egypt, this is a cue for a description and history of the Nile Valley, occupying the whole of the second book, and the story of Darius's subsequent expedition against Scythia leads naturally to a long digression on the geography and customs of that country. The narrative in the later books, dealing with the actual Persian invasion of Greece, is naturally less broken, but till then at least it is interrupted by constant episodes and digression, here a chapter, there a whole book. It is the historian's practice, as he himself says, to introduce prostekas, additions, whenever anything even remotely connected with the matter in hand occurs to him as likely to interest the reader. The net result is really a history of the Near East, and a good deal besides, a summary of popular knowledge or belief respecting recent events, and the world is known more or less to the Greeks, which eventually, after branching out into countless digressions and divigations, centers in the crowning narrative of Marathon, Thermopylae, Salamis, Plataea. Tortuously, but never tediously, Herodotus' history moves to this goal. For all his discursiveness, he does not lack unity. He is the first, it has been said, to construct a long and elaborate narrative in which many parts are combined in due subordination and arrangement to make one great whole. So keep in mind when we're working through this book that there is a unifying purpose to this, and he is, Herodotus is going to be setting the context for the war, the conflict, the situation between Persia and Greece. And in order to do that, he's telling about all these different people and tribes and nations and customs, all that stuff that's going to provide insight into the reasoning and the context for what he's writing about. That a narrative so comprehensive in its nature, dealing with so great a variety of subjects and drawn from sources so miscellaneous, should contain much which cannot be regarded as serious history is only to be expected. It is impossible to generalize where popular belief and ascertained fact, hearsay, and ocular evidence are blended. The historical value of the matter found in Herodotus' works work varies not merely from volume to volume or from book to book, but from paragraph to paragraph, from sentence to sentence, from line to line. Every separate story, every individual statement is to be tried on its own merits. Many critics have not taken the trouble to exercise this discrimination, it was for a long time the fashion to dismiss the father of history as a garrulous raconteur, hoping to deceive his readers as easily as he himself was deceived by his informants. This parcel of lies type of criticism may now, fortunately, be considered extinct. So in other words, for a long period of time in the modern era, and even in some venues going back into the classical times, it was rather fashionable to criticize Herodotus as being unscientific and rambling and credulous. He would believe anything. He told wild stories. But as we'll see, that was part of his method. He was a storyteller. And in many cases, he actually was very exemplary for his objectivity. He simply told the stories that he was told and very often leaves them without judgment. It should be now, says Dr. Macon, universally recognized that the most stringent application of historical and critical methods to the text of Herodotus leaves the work irremovably and irreplaceably at the head of European prose literature, whether in its scientific or in its artistic character. 
He has been blamed for a garrulity which gives currency to much which is alleged to be beneath the dignity of history. Garrulity means basically to be excessively talkative, especially talking about trivial matters. But most scholars must now agree that even from the historical standpoint, the world would have lost much of infinite value had Herodotus been more reticent. His garrulity is often proved to, to point the way to right conclusions. Obviously, the condition of human beliefs and opinions falls within the field of history. Where Herodotus plainly and demonstrably errs, he is often of supreme interest as indicating contemporary thought, which he not only summarizes but criticizes as well. So in other words, Herodotus, as a man of his time, by telling us just sort of unremarkable beliefs, gives us insight into what was commonly believed at that time. His geography and his meteorology are representative of a stage of thought. He has not arrived at truth, naturally, but he is consistent with a current opinion which is nearer to truth than earlier conceptions of the world. It is true that the sun's course is not affected, as Herodotus believes it to be, by the wind. It is also true that the Danube does not rise in the Pyrenees, and that the course of the upper Nile is not from west to east. But no one in his time knew better. He reflects and discusses contemporary opinion. He rejects earlier and more primitive ideas. It may be counted to him for righteousness, that if he knows much less than Strabo, at least he knows a great deal more than Homer. Always and everywhere Herodotus gives us the best that is accessible to him, and it is one of his great merits as a historian that he does not give it uncritically. Scanty justice, till lately, has been done him in this matter. In reality, his manner of retelling what has been told to him shows anything but credulity. Definite acceptance is much rarer than plain expression of disbelief in what he has heard. Quote, they say, but I do not believe it, unquote, is a very frequent introduction. This attitude is shown by the grammatical construction of the narrative, a construction which translation cannot always reproduce without awkwardness and which is sometimes therefore overlooked altogether. The fact remains that much of the story is cast in the mold of reported speech, showing that the writer is not stating that so-and-so is a fact, but only that it has been told to him and the oratio obliqua is maintained throughout the narrative. Herodotus deliberately professes that this is his method. Quote, I know not what the truth may be. I tell the tale to as told to me. End quote. In view of these plain statements, to attack Herodotus for foolish credulity is nothing less than disingenuous. Some harm, moreover, has been done to Herodotus's reputation by the tendency of modern languages to alter the meaning of derived words. Herodotus repeats muthoi. Now, a muthos is simply a tale with no implication of falsity. It may just as well be true as not. Speaking here of the ancient Greek word for story, which has come down to modern usage as the word myth. But when we say that Herodotus repeats myths, that is an altogether different matter. matter. Myth and mythical carry the implication of falsehood and Herodotus is branded as a dupe or a liar who cannot be taken seriously as an authority for everything. So, as part of his history, Herodotus is passing on myth, which in his day meant story, but when we hear the word myth in the modern age, we tend to think of something that's made up or false, or at the very least, an analogy or an allegory. But uh, Herodotus is simply a storyteller. Herodotus's reputation for untrustworthiness arises, in fact, from his professed method of giving a hearing to every opinion. This has been of great service to those who early and late have accused him of deliberate and perhaps interested falsification of historical fact. These attacks began with Plutarch. They have been more than once renewed in modern times by critics desirous of a name for originality and independence. None of them can be regarded as of any serious importance. They leave Herodotus's credit untouched for the simple reason that they are hardly ever based on solid evidence. Plutarch's treatise on Herodotus's malignity only establishes his own. Modern critics who maintain that Herodotus's praise and blame is unjustly distributed have seldom any witness to appeal to save the historian himself, and failing necessary support ab extra, they can only assert the a priori improbability that an historian who is inaccurate in one narrative should be accurate in another. It is quite possible that the heroes of the history were not heroic, and the villains not so villainous as the historian paints them. 
But we have no evidence as to the private life of Cyrus or Cambyses beyond what the historian himself has given us. Nor is there any justification for depreciating the services of Athens to Greece because the eulogist of Athens happened to believe that the Danube rises in the Pyrenees and that the sun's course is affected by the wind. It cannot be denied that Herodotus invites criticism. Plainly enough, a great deal of the evidence on which he relies must be more substantial than simple hearsay. He has undoubtedly learnt much from documents engraved or written. To take one instance, the long and detailed catalogue of nations included in the Persian Empire and the amounts of tribute paid by each must rest on some documentary authority. But he will not support his credit by producing his proofs. At least, he does so seldom. For the most part, his fonts are included under what he has heard. He may have seen this, he may have read that, but all, it is all set down as hearsay and no more. There could be no better way of opening the door to suspicious critics. So I pause here to point out that this Herodotus is writing before the time when history and scientific methodology was formalized. We have come to expect, as the discipline developed, we have come to expect that writers and historians, when they make a statement, when they relate something, when they tell a story, when they tell an event or a fact that they include a source, a documentary source or otherwise, of where they got that information or where they heard it so that we can be prudent and we can know the reliability or the likelihood of something being true or not. Herodotus is writing before that, and so he's not bound by these, by these conventions of documentary evidence. So much of what he says is admittedly hearsay. But keep in mind, he's the first guy to write a book of this sort. So obviously there are many suspicious critics because he doesn't often provide sources for what he's saying. But that, that might be an unjust criticism, as Godley is pointing out here. Further, some of the qualities which can constitute the charm of his narrative make him suspect to those who ask only from history that it should be a plain statement of what did actually happen. Herodotus is preeminently biographical. Personal passion and desire is the guiding motive of events. They are attributed to individual action more than to the force of circumstance. Debatable situations are described in terms of an actual debate between named champions of this or that policy. As in Euripides, nay, as even in the comparatively matter-of-fact narrative of Thucydides. Nor is it only the human individual will which decides. It is the superhuman above all. To the fortunes of individuals and communities are presented to us as they appear to a Greek who sees in human life a sphere for the realization of divine judgments. To theon is always working. To theon is the Greek expression meaning roughly divine providence. To theon is always working, whether as nemesis to balance good and evil fortune and correct overweening pride and excessive prosperity by corresponding calamity, or as eternal justice to punish actual wrongdoing. Such beliefs, common to all ages, find a special prominence in the history of Herodotus, as they do in Greek tragedy. The stories of Croesus, Polycrates, Cambyses, the fall of Troy, all are illustrations of a divine ordering of human affairs. Indeed, the central subject of the story, the debacle of the vast Persian expedition against Hellas, exemplifies the maxim, and I'm, just, I'm going to skip the Greek and just read the English, Insolence, once vainly stuffed with wealth that is not proper or good for it, when it has scaled the topmost ramparts, is hurled to a dire doom. And he's quoting there from Sophocles, uh, Oedipus Tyrannus. History thus written is a means to moral edification, and Herodotus may not be above the suspicion of twisting the record of events so as to inculcate a moral lesson. Such predispositions make history more dramatic and more interesting, but those may be excused who hold that they mitigate against strict accuracy. So part of Herodotus's, Herodotus's intent here is to present some moral commentary and present stories which teach a moral lesson about the nature of life on earth and how it ends up leading to global events such as the war between Persia and Greece. So keep an eye on that when we're reading, especially when there are these, these long narratives between people which you wonder i wonder how he got that speech or where did he hear that 
he might be actually putting those words in their mouth to give a moral lesson, to teach a moral lesson to the reader.